the speaker for this today's for today's webinar. Today's webinar will be delivered by Kate Richardson, and she'll be talking to us about 30 years of birds of birds KwaZulu Natal and where we have been and where we have learned along the way. So just a little bit before I hand over to Kate. Kate is the, the part interest group of KwaZulu Natal started in 1994 at an inaugural meeting in Durban Natural Science Museum. Since then, they have learned a lot about birds, talked about birds, cared about birds, learned about the environment, and also they have made friends along the way. They have had fun and learned a lot about themselves and uh, 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 along this process. In this talk, which is today, Kate is going to take us through a trip down memory lane to discuss some of the highlights of the years, what has worked and what did not work and how things have changed in bad work over the 30 years. With that brief introduction, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Kate to take over. Kate, over to you. I've actually had a blast putting this together and um, I, I hope you, I know we've got some people who are going to be seeing their own pictures very much younger, but um, I hope everybody else is going to pick up on the lessons we've learned along the way. There's not going to be an awful lot about serious science stuff in here, but it's a lot about running a bat group. So disclaimer, um, there's a lot of bats being handled with bare hands in this presentation. Nowadays, we don't do it anymore, but these are historical photos. When we first started off 30 years ago, nobody ever worried about the virus these bats could carry because it's so minor, it's so tiny. And yes, we've had one or two deaths from it. And yeah, I'm, I'm one of the people nowadays that goes, don't handle bats with your bare hands. But in the old days, we did. Okay, so for those of you that don't know where KZN is, um, there's South Africa on the top on the map, just down the bottom of Africa, as you would expect. We are that red province on the right hand side, KwaZulu Natal. And if you look at the map on the bottom left, it's, it's, a, it's a province of great extremes. We've got mountains on the west, which are high compared to European mountains. They don't quite reach the Rockies, but they're in the same league. And then all the way down onto the coast. And the coast uh, is very wet. It's subtropical. It's wet and warm and lots of bats there. We are also, if you look at the bottom right, uh, in a biodiversity hotspot, which is very nice. It means we have a lot of interesting bats here as well. So how did we all start? Well, top right hand side there, there's Peter Taylor looking a little younger than he does now. And many, many years ago, in 1993, 94, I was working at the Natural Science Museum on a contract for Peter Taylor. And Peter had asked me to go in to um, sort out one of their collections they had newly got. That the, the photo you see on the left there, actually the insect is the insect room, but the mammal room is kind of similar. It's lots and lots of cabinets of lots of dead animals. Um, and Peter and I had a kind of, it wasn't a fight because we both knew that neither of us knew the answer to it anyway, but we knew the bat numbers in Europe had gone down drastically in the previous kind of 50 years. And we started saying, so what are they doing in South Africa? We really, really didn't know. And then this paper came out, thanks Bat Conservation Trust. Um, this paper came out, the growth and development of bat conservation in Britain. And they talked about bat groups and what, having citizen scientists out there and bat groups out there could actually do. And Peter said, let's start a bat group. And so we borrowed a room at the museum. And in those days, there was no Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups to send messages out to. We simply contacted the people we thought might be interested and sent a few um, messages out to people, telephoned people and so on. And made a date when we could all re meet to start talking about starting a back group. Um, that photo there uh, is George and Joyce Skinner. Um, they're absolute sweeties. And Joyce at that point was a volunteer at the museum. So she took school groups around the museum, um, interpreting parts of the, the displays and so on. And the story goes, and I totally believe it, 
Joyce went home and said to George, oh, this nice young man at the museum wants to start a bat group. And she said, nobody's going to turn up to a meeting about bats. So she said, you and I are going to go along just to support him. And um, they came along and they were our, some of our, more, two of our more stalwart members because they did all the school talks for many, many years and George did roost visits and et cetera, et cetera. So lesson one from this, take the pity vote can lead to great things. Yes, she pitied us. And that fact, there was quite a reasonable number of people at that first meeting, but um, it was good to get George and Joyce on board. When we first started, we worked through the Delborough Natural Science Museum Friends Society. And that was really nice of them because they had a bank account and they had mailing lists and they had um, things like that. So we could run from the start, we could run as a back group without having to try all those. And then we found, we, we eventually split from them. Um, I think it was about eight years later. So lesson two, bat people are nice people. And bat people are always willing to help out. And these were some of the, the early helpers we had. Top left-hand side, most of you will recognize Merlin Tuttle. And Merlin was a great supporter. He was, he was instrumental in a lot of our thinking. And we still do this. We still believe in the Tuttle equation of try and be nice to people. Even if they've killed some bats and you're really, really angry with them and you just want to punch them in the face, try and be nice to them so you get them on the bat side. So they walk away going, yeah, bats are good guys. And so we've never threatened anybody with um, calling in the police or the NSPCA. No, we did once. But in general, we don't call in the police or the NSPCA. We try and talk people through this and point out what's wrong. Merlin also gave us um, or was instrumental in us getting the slideshow, the Bat Conservation International slideshow, Myth and Reality. And yes, it was a slideshow. It was one of those, for those people who've never done this, yes, there were slides and you went, you had to put them in a machine and it went and it changed the slide and and it changed the next slide. And it was an ordinary magnetic tape, a cassette tape. And for those of you who are old enough or who are not old enough to remember cassette tape sometimes caught on things and got scratched and stretched a little bit. And to this day, if somebody mentions Lavia Franz, I'm inclined to go the yellowing bat of Africa, because at that point, the tape went crazy. Um, and then on the right hand side there, that's not a face that most of us know, but certainly the name we would know. Um, that is Sue Barnard from the States. Some of you will know her from her Bats in Captivity books. Um, but Sue, in the early days of bats generally, ran, she, she was always on the end of an email, if we got stuck with any of the rehab work, or what do we do with a pup, what we do with this, she was on the end of an email, she was super supportive. And she also ran an email group in the early days called Batline. And Batline was very instrumental in getting bat people throughout the world talking to each other and answering questions, and it was a super resource before we had Facebook or anything else, we had Batline and it was good. So we've had quite a few different iterations over the years of logos and the Bat Interest Group. For some reason, we don't have Durban on it, but it, we started off as the Durban Bat Interest Group and that is just the city of Durban. And then we realized that actually we were working in the province generally. So we leveled up to Bat Interest Group of KwaZulu-Natal or Bats KZN. And we've changed the logo a couple of times and we realized this last year that everybody in the group is using three completely different logos. So watch the space. We have asked a professional designer to take them all and combine them and produce a new logo. So we will have a new logo, hopefully in a little while. Now in the old days, um, when we talk about contacts, we mean any member of the public that wants to talk to us about something. So. Sometimes they want to talk to a school or a roost visit, or they want to ask about the bats in their tree, or they want to tell us to get their, our bats out their roof. And so we, we did paper leaflets. We could send them out and we could give them away to schools and so on. Please look after the bats. And then to keep in contact with our members, we sent out a newsletter once a month. Yes, on paper in an envelope with a stamp. And it turned up in people's post boxes. Um, you know, nowadays we, we have superseded that with Facebook and WhatsApp groups and everything else, but I'm not sure 
that we haven't lost something along the way as well. When the newsletter came in once a month, you sat down and you read it and you took it in. Now I don't know about the rest of you, but I have so much information flying past me on WhatsApp and Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and everything else that a lot of the times I lose information and it can be difficult to go back and remember what I really went, meant to look up. Then after a while, um, in the early days, we just had our home phones um, and people would contact us on that and we would sometimes play phone tag with, we'll get hold of so-and-so, we'll get hold of so-and-so. And then we got a BAT helpline, which was a cell phone, which was nice because there was then one number. And that has now been superseded by, thanks Kirsten and Amy, by a QR code and a WhatsApp group for help. Lesson three here, be nice to the people replying to contacts. Non-BAT people can be really, really mean. And it's an incredibly stressful job answering that phone. And get your bats out my roof or I'm going to kill them all. And those, those sort of calls can be really tough to take. So big shout out to everybody who handles the BAT helpline and the QR code. Amy's done a, a lot of the heavy lifting over the past while, but it's tough. So roost visit lessons. Oh, we've got lots of lessons we learned from roost visits. Um, so there's a there was a roost visit. That's Stuart and Brenda and Wendy going to Border Cave, which is on the border between um, KwaZulu Natal and Eswatini. Um, views might be good, but you need a really good head for heights. <laughs> I've never been there, but I got that it really is that steep. Lesson five: Not all stains are caused by bats. This was a um, a church, a very old church we went into in the Midlands, that's sort of in between us and the Drakensberg. And there was a lot of staining on the floor, on the far side, kind of the right hand side there, beside the brick wall. And we went in and looked around the church and kind of the, the church people pointed out all the stains. There were bats in the roof, there were three tails in the roof. Um, and we said, yes, but is that not rain? And they said, why would it be rain? And we said, well, there's a hole in your roof. We can see blue sky. And everybody kind of looked up and went, oh, because that whole wall at the end was falling off that way and the vestry was falling off this way and there was another crack down there. Um, so not all stains are caused by that. Sometimes the buildings are falling apart and it is fascinating how many people don't notice that. Oh, in the old days, we never had cell phones in our pockets. So if you went into a roof and you couldn't identify the bat, you had to wriggle through the roof without falling through the ceiling boards with a bat in one hand. And that's Uva trying to get through with a bat in one hand. It's not as easy as it sounds, actually. You kind of need hands for getting through. Nowadays, you take your cell phone in and you take a photo. Much easier. That is one big improvement. Uh, lesson seven. This is us on the way to Nsiswe Mine in the Eastern Cape. It's a mine built on, it's mine on several levels. It's got some interesting bats in there. Um, Remedy Rescue, which we use on our bats, the, the solution form is actually very high in alcohol. So when one of the humans comes out going, I can't feel my lips, it might be because they've actually drunk too much Rescue Remedy. <laughs> it's not the bats. And you're never fit enough for roost visits. You think you are averagely fit. And then you find out that walking up a damn wall, and this is Pongola Dam, um, walking up a damn wall can actually be an awful lot of stairs. This was a fun outing. Um, this was, well, actually, this wasn't us actually in the crocodile farm at that point. We were just packing up to leave for the crocodile farm. But if you're catching bats in a crocodile farm at night with limited lighting, and there's only chicken mesh between you and the crocodiles, and you've got five kids with you, keep counting the kids. Our youngest one there, I think was three at the time. And um, there were so many adults saying, for heaven's sake, be careful, don't climb on fences. But eventually the kids got sick of it and went and sat in the truck. But yeah, keep counting heads. And this is a fun one. If you've never done it, do it. If you're going into a mine with bats and you can't see a darn thing, you can't possibly focus on a fast moving animal to take a photo. So just point your camera into the dark and shoot because you actually might get some really, really good photos. These were photos taken at Nsiswe Mine as well. Um, and yeah, it comes out great because the bats will fly quite close to you. 
Yeah, lesson 11, some roosts are just creepy. That's in Seasway Mine as well. And those trail train tracks out of the old mine just lead from dry land down into the depths. Nobody I know has ever been down there to find out what's down there. I don't think we want to know. Lesson 12, when checking road culverts for slit face bats, it's possibly safer to check from the top because the snakes and porcupines are usually on the bottom and you don't want to walk into them. So check them from the top. That was us checking road culverts for slit face bats on the northern Quezaden coast. Lesson 13, do not stand under bat houses while you open them. That's Peter Taylor very sensibly balancing right the way around. So when he opens that large bat house, which had a large number of free tails, who had obviously been eating a lot, that he knew that the guano was not going to dump on him. Um, on the bottom right there is one of our old members, other Peter, who didn't get the memo about not standing underneath a bat house. And that really is bat poo all over him. This was what we did in the old days. Nowadays, everybody would have hysterics. And that was Sandra Vadam and Eswatini. Yeah, sometimes wild bats just don't want to leave. Um, <laughs> this was an evening we did at the Telcom building in Durban, catching bats for uh, Wanda Marketer for her PhD. Um, but I did put it in here because we talk a lot about the fight or flight syndrome when we talk about animals in general. Do they fight um, like a hippocidorus? We've got really sharp teeth and use them. Um, do they fly away fast like a little banana bat? Yeah, some of our bats do, but some of our bats do the third option, which is freeze. And we know that's available because think of something like a baby buck or a baby hare being left out in the bush by their mothers. Their only defense is don't move. And if you think about the epimophorus, they're relatively small for fruit bats. They live in trees during the day. If a goshawk flies in, well, there's no way they're going to outfly a goshawk because the goshawk will be faster. And there's no way they're going to fight him because the goshawk's bigger and it's got a sharper beak. So your only option is don't move. So they freeze. And so I don't think we take this into account often enough. I have heard of people describe some bats as totally calm. And I've looked in that, no, they're not. They're in tonic immobility. They're frozen. And so a lot of our fruit bats do. They won't move until they feel they're safe. And so in a case like that, with, with that bat, all you have to do is to walk across to somewhere where it's dark, where there are no lights, no humans, and the bat will fly away on its own. So lesson 15, if the cave is too small, send in a human. No, I'm only kidding, really. It was quite a big space and the parents were there, so we actually don't send in small humans into caves on their own. Although that one would have been quite happy to go into the cave on his own. Uh, lesson 16. I hope his mother is smiling at this one. Check all the bat volunteers are washable because you know what? Sometimes bat outings are pretty muddy. And that was an outing to the Shangweni Dam Tunnel. And then sometimes you just can't find the bats at all. Um, I, these, two, these two are taken at different times, so I don't know what Stuart's really looking for, but there are actually bats in that photo on the left. And you actually have to expand it quite a lot to be able to see them. There are fruit bats hanging right up under the under the, the leaves there. Cryptic, don't move, freeze. So grounded bats, um, another photo that I'm probably never ever going to show again, but it's one of my favorite all time photos. We see about 60 bats a year. So um, multiply that by 30, but we don't have records for all of them because not everybody fills in their forms, as Kristen has found out this year. So we have records for about 1,400 bats. Now, this I'm going to say to anybody who's just starting off their 30 years in a bat group, keep all the records you can. You can get some interesting things out of it. For those people that have the records and have never bothered to analyze them, Excel works well. Try it. It's fun. So this is a picture of, um, it's actually a picture of Durban, which is the city within the municipality of Etiquini. So you can see it's quite a big, busy city in the middle. And there's the bay on the right-hand side. The sea is on the other side of those big buildings. And then in Durban, we have a massive interconnected Durban metropolitan open space system. And if anybody knows who Deborah Roberts is, follow her on Twitter. 
um, or LinkedIn because Deborah was very instrumental in starting our metropolitan open space system way back when. But it means that a lot of Durban is very close to natural bush and it means that we have got a lot of wild animals um, very close to houses and very close to humans, which is why we pick up bats as well. So of our 1,400 grounded bats, this is an absolutely random sample of bats, which were grounded in KZN. We don't ask for the bats. They come to us from concerned members of the public. So we don't go out and look for them. And it's, it's not entirely random as far as where they come from in Durban, because we have suburbs where people are more nature friendly and they're more likely to call us. And then we obviously have areas which have less trees, less flowers, etc. And so we have less bats there. But grounded bats in general, this is a random sample. So I, in 2017, 2018, um, I decided to analyze some of this, um, this data. And if we take them all, this that graph on the bottom is very much as we would expect. In the southern hemisphere here, the bats are, um, are born at the start of the warm, wet season. So the bats are mostly born in November, December, they, and this is when you get pregnant females falling in swimming pools, baby bats falling out of roosts, and then in January and into February, the juveniles who make a mistake when they're flying. And then it gradually tails off for the rest of the year. Most of the bats we get July, August, September, which is in the middle of winter, are our fruit bats because they're around the whole time and they don't sleep for days at a time. They have to eat the whole time. So what, I'm sorry, there should be um, years on the bottom there, but this was a very typical example of what we'd expect. That's the large eared, uh, sorry, the Egyptian free tail. We don't really get them in Durban. We've got them, there are colonies, but we see them at a very low level throughout the years. So over the 20 years, we see them occasionally, not a lot. This one we see a lot more, and this one's an interesting one. This is the large eared free tail, Automox martiensini. And from, I don't think we can really count 1994 because we weren't really working then. So people didn't know us to call us in for bats. But we get a reasonable number of bats through the years. And then suddenly we get no grounded automops at all, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. And this has relevance because if you were doing a survey, for example, for a wind farm, which hopefully we'll never see on the east coast of Africa, but if you were doing a survey for a wind farm or if you were doing a survey for anything else that you have to know about the bats and you came in in one of those years, you would find very, very few automobs. We don't know whether that was a population collapse or they just didn't breed that year. The most likely is they'd actually moved, but whether they moved because there was no food here or whether they moved because there was better food somewhere else, honestly, we don't know. We just know that they weren't there. And so we have to take that into account when we're doing surveys. Our bats move, our bats change their, their distribution. This one's an interesting one. This is the yellow house bat or the yellow bellied house bat, Scotophilus. Um, you can see from the numbers in the 1990s, we had fairly high numbers coming in every year. We would see 14 or 15. And then gradually over the years, we've seen less and less and less. We've seen us. Just we're, we're getting about that at the moment of the last year, we've had one or two in, but not the numbers that we used to have. Now that's interesting because these are cold weather bats. These guys love to put on weight and seriously, if you've got them in sanctuary, they seriously put on weight, but they put on weight at the end of summer and they're happy to go torpid for days at a time, if not weeks, we're never quite sure, but they're happy to sleep away most of winter. But they absolutely hate very, very hot weather. And so on those one or two days in summer when it's really crazy, crazy hot, people if people ever phone us up and say the bats and their bats just crawled out of my roof and they're just hanging in full daylight, there's a good number, there's a good chance it is a scotophilus because they don't like those, those extreme heat events. And we think, I had a guess, nothing to prove it, but we think that is a climate shift issue. This one's a really interesting one. So our little free tail bats, cute little bats, very interactive with humans um, when you have them in sanctuary. They're 
quite small, so head and body about the size of my thumb. Now, when we looked at the numbers, the graph of what numbers of little free tails we got in over the ground advance over the 20 years, the numbers were all over the place. They didn't make sense at all. So what I did was I took all the numbers, divided it by the number of years, and you get an average of what you would expect to get in every year. And then I said, okay, which years did we get under average and which years did we get over average? And you end up with a graph like that, which doesn't look like anything at all until you start searching the internet and you find a graph that it kind of matches. It's not perfect, but it's sort of close, two up, one down, two up, sort of mishmash all over the place, two up, etc. cetera. Um, the interesting thing about that is the bottom graph are sea temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. Now, for those of you who aren't from the Southern Hemisphere, that on the bottom is the El Nino, La Nina Southern Oscillation. And the interesting thing is we're not anywhere near the Pacific Ocean. We're on the Indian Ocean. We're the other side of the world to the Pacific Ocean. And yet, somehow, our bats are tracking the ENSOs. I haven't worked that one out yet. It must be something to do with um, my oceanographer relative suggests it's something to do with wind patterns and the wind could be blowing um, the moths and so on around that is food. It could be ocean temperatures, but it doesn't look like it. It's something to do with the environment that our bats are following. So, and again, this is really important. If we're doing surveys of bats, what do we do with, with that? Except to say, we've got a problem here. So lesson 18, we don't know nearly enough about the long-term movements of our bats. and we need to pick up that survey work again. We haven't, um, I haven't actually analyzed the data for what, six years now, um, but we have to keep doing that to see whether we are dealing with climate shift, whether we're dealing with El Nino Southern oscillations. People have long said our animals in the Southern hemisphere work on seven year cycles. And I don't think they are seven year cycles. I think they're the, the El Nino cycles. Talks and walks. Um, this is something, again, we can't do. Now, that's a perspex-fronted cage that I used to take my fruit bats out in. And you had to choose your fruit individual fruit bats quite carefully because some of the sanctuary bats loved going out and some just didn't. But unfortunately, now my current permit doesn't permit me to do that. You talk to the big guys and they say, of course, you should be able to do that. Just ask so-and-so to fix your permit and ask so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so won't fix my permit. So still under discussion, it would be nice to be able to do that. I think it's really important for kids to be able to see bats up close, to be able to see that the bats are watching them when they're watching the bats and such like. I had to give a shout out to the magentas here. We have had those magenta bat detectors for, I think, I need to check, but I think it's close on 20 years. And they have been handled by kids. They have been bashed by kids. They have been dropped. They have been stood on. They have been left out in the rain. They have been dropped in mud. And they're taped together and somehow they keep going. So well done, Magenta. Yeah, those are great. Those are, that's, that's a great bat detector for kids because you can give it to the kids and you don't have to hover over them. Um, here's one. I bet you we've got her chuckling because she's on this call. Be nice to students. On the left there is a student we had in Eswatini on a field trip we did. She's working out how to put up a, a misnet. And on the right, Dr. Lee Richards is giving a talk to a large number of people at Beechwood Mangroves and it's got everybody's attention. So it's nice to see people moving up and on. And then when you're giving a talk, planting a sleeper agent in the audience really helps. So if you've got just bat group members in the audience just starting to talk to people about bats, it, it, it really engages everybody much more and it gives them questions to ask while you're running around setting up the, the, slide, the PowerPoint presentation and so on. Uh, this was a show we did at Beechwood Mangroves as well. We spoke to so many people and then everybody packed up and left and went home. And the hardest part of the day was getting the gazebo back into the bag. And Les, Les and Matthew look very proud to have managed it. So we also run training courses. Um, we 
usually once a year we run an introduction to bats training course which is a general we love getting the bird people there because it's just a general introduction to what bats are like and then we take them into the well we used to take them into the shangreni dam tunnel um that i point out we did not have merlin tuttle on a, on a talk that was just a trip we did through the shangreni tunnel it's currently the reserve is was had a hostile takeover and we're not quite sure whether we can get there so currently we're doing the training course online it's not as nice. It's nicer to have people where you can actually take them out and show them real life bats, but it's the best we can do at the moment. And in our introduction to bats and in all our courses, we spend a lot of time saying, please use gloves, gloves or a cloth to handle bats. And we say it so much that sometimes somebody says, I'm so scared of bats now, I won't go near one. And then guaranteed somebody in the next week is gonna send us a picture of handling bats without gloves. So, I, I, if you've run into that yourselves, don't worry about it. Sometimes people just don't listen. And here's actually a very serious one that, um, yeah, Wendy and I got asked to do a, a basically the introduction to BATS course um, at a, a separate venue. And we said, of course, you pay for petrol, we'll come and do it. And we did the talk. And then we found out the organizer was charging delegates an arm and a leg. And we were in the back group wasn't getting any of it. So we now are very careful to check. If we think the course is being charged for, we're very careful to check about where that money is going. We don't demand money, but we can ask for a donation. And if, it, if we think the organizer is making a lot of money out of it, we'll ask for a large donation. We also run two different courses for grounded bats and injured bats. The grounded bats is our ambulance course and the rehabilitation bats is a much more serious one. Um, when you can't afford to rent a space, borrow somebody's house, shove your furniture out the way, borrow everybody's patio chairs, and there you go. You've got yourself a, a venue for a course. That was a big rehabilitation course we did. And lesson 26, there are never enough bat people to help out. Um, we've gone to using, so for example, we have a video that we can send out by WhatsApp to people who found a baby on the ground, how to return it to their mother. We're happy to share it with anybody who wants it. We do know some veterinarians that are willing to help. We've got a national bat rescue group now and an ambulance group. So we can say to people, is anybody near a poor father? Can they help? Um, which helps. And we do run bat care training courses. It's never enough. And there's never enough people. Sometimes when you need photos, here's another lesson. It's easier not to use live bats at all. So that is the Stella Luna doll. And I am so sad they stopped making it because she's the right size and shape for anything you need to do about an epimophorus. So that's our little Stella Luna showing people how you would anesthetize a fruit bat. Middle one, we couldn't get a decent photo of a bat being released because it's such a short time. So we released that bat. That's a rubber bat, but it actually looks like a bat. And then that roof on the right-hand side doesn't have bats in, but we needed somebody going into the roof. So we just shoved my daughter up there actually. So one of our biggest successes has been working with the pest controllers. Um, when we first started this, we realized people were actually poisoning bats, which is strictly illegal, but if you do it on the quiet, nobody knows. We produced a little booklet called Bats and Roofs, which is sold online, which when people phone us up and complain about bats and the roofs, we say, read that book first and then come back to us. And then we registered our, what we call the poisons course and the bats and roofs course with the pest control industry. So people attending that course can now get CPD points. So they actually get something out of it, which is good. This was a Merlin Tuttle lesson, keep control of the story. And it stood us in good stead. So, this is a very typical situation in Durban. We have something called the borer beetle, which is a wood boring beetle. And once your house has got it in the eaves, it's very difficult to deal with it unless you actually tent the house. And so we taught the pest control operators how to check for bats in the roof, how to exclude them if there is. So the bats get excluded before the house is poisoned. And at that point for on these photos, we actually had a group of um, television people interviewing doing a story on this and how they exclude bats and um, how the houses have to be tented and so on. And that is Wendy on the bottom right hand side giving an interview. I see they've got her backed up against the wall and that's really keeping your back to the wall. 
but um, they were actually a really nice group to work with. I generally find most people are really nice to work with when they're dealing, when you're dealing with the media. Um, but it is important to keep control of the story. And we have found that if you're dealing with um, anybody who's going to write an article for a, a newspaper or a magazine or a Facebook page or whatever, if you say to them, yes, of course, I'll give you the information, but can you run it past me before you publish it? Nearly all our, everybody we've, we've ever dealt with said, yes, of course, because they don't want mistakes to get out too. And it does give you time to catch any of the mistakes before they go out. Weekends away. Um, yeah, sometimes the ablutions are fun with weekends away. That was a kind of, yeah, that was a shower. In the old days, we used to take our bats with us everywhere red. Those were sanitary bats, so they were the hand reared babies. And um, that was a boat road after a car ride and then a long walk before we got to the place. It was up in the Nabella Peninsula. Um, we don't do that anymore. And I, I think we've lost something. I think we've lost a lot of our interaction with our bats because we used to treat them more like pet dogs. Hey, we'll take them with us, of course. We are running a course up there, so the sanctuary bats come too, not a problem. This was a um, long time ago. It was one of our weekends away we did in Kuzi Game Reserve. It was actually um, discussion and training on using a bat detector in the early days. So I think for a weekend away, taking cooking to or eating together is a very important thing. So many of our weekends away, we just say, ah, oh, take your own food and everybody takes cereal and boiled eggs and so on. And we don't sit down and eat together. And that weekend at Mkuzi was one of the nicest ones I think we've ever done. And we had Tammy there with her with helpers cooking food and cooking meals for us. So we actually all sat down and ate together. And I think that's important. And lesson 33, Second to last one, you don't get to 30 years without people. And a massive thanks to everybody who's helped along the way. Not everybody's photo is there, I know. I couldn't fit everybody on and I couldn't find photos of a couple of people I wanted to, but a big thanks to everybody who has helped out in the back group over the years. We wouldn't have done it without everybody. And last lesson, there are always new things to be learned. In February this year, we did a field trip to Clarence and we actually found a Stugo, glandwing bats, a Stugidae. That's the first one of that family I've ever seen. So it's nice to be able to say, even after 30 years, there's always new things to be learned. Thank you, everybody. Questions? Thank you very much, Kate, for that exciting journey taking us through the 30 years of the wonderful work that you have been up to. I think we have a couple of questions in the chat which I'll be able to read out and then you can respond to that. Okay. Uh, the first question is from Evelyn Chalwe. Evelyn is asking when you get bats from the members of the public, do you release them back to their natural habitat? That's the intention. It's always the intention. Um, of on an average year, um, about a third come in that just can't be saved. They're either dead in arrival or they die within a, a very short while. Um, there was one very sad case where I went to pick one up and there's this little tiny little kid with big eyes going, you are going to make it better, aren't you? And I'm sitting looking at this bat in my hand and thinking nothing short of divine intervention is gonna make this bat better. So yeah, sometimes sometimes they die in us. Um, we're getting tougher about forcing them to exercise to leave. At one point, we were very much, oh, shame, they don't want to exercise, we won't make them. And now we're getting tougher about going, you know what, I'm not looking after you for the next 10 years, you're just going to have to leave. Um, so I think probably, a, it's probably about 45% now that we're releasing fine. And then we have a small percentage that for some reason can't be released. Thank you, Kate. There's another question from Pai Hawa. Pai is asking, was there a drop in the members of public reporting grounded bats during COVID? Did public perception of bats change during COVID? Um, not too bad, actually. We, we thought it was going to be worse than it was. We were sort of um, holding our breaths and hiding under the table because we thought it was going to be bad. 
It wasn't really. Um, people in this country kind of already either believe that bats aren't any problem at all and they just kind of live with us, or they're all rabid and they don't carry rabies in, in Africa, but people believe they do. So it wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. We did see a drop in numbers and a, several of them, you know, when we were under lockdown, we just said the arguments as to whether we were essential um, essential services to go and pick one up um, was a big argument. We never fully actually sorted that one out. So sometimes we just had to give the best information we could about releasing them and letting it take its chances. Thank you very much, Kate. I think this was a very interesting presentation and also to just see the lessons, the way you put them, it was amazing. It's also amazing to just see your advice on keeping the records and what you can do with the kind of analysis that you can do with that record that you're able to keep. But mm -hmm. there could be others also, maybe the, a young conservation, conservationist out there who is thinking of establishing a bat group what advice can you give them? Like what activities should they start with and then they can build on later on to get to where you are, you, you are today? Um, start off by giving talks to schools or to wildlife groups. Um, general wildlife groups or bird clubs are really great places to give talks to because you've already got a group of people who are interested and willing to learn. Um, don't try talking to teenagers until you're really experienced at it because teenagers are, they either know it all or they don't want to know anything. Um, primary school kids, so ages from about six to about 12 are the best group to start talking to. Get yourself um, a PowerPoint presentation and a data projector and um, start showing pretty pictures. That's the best way of doing it. Or if you can um, organize with a school, and if you can get some cheap bat detectors like the magentas, um, what you can do is do a talk at the school at dusk and then um, all go out and listen to the bats. Because if you're in a, a reasonably healthy area, you should be able to hear bats around. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Albert. Albert, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and just ask your question. I think the question is saving is saying having all and bat boxes out same area. I I I, I can't um, find, kind of understand that question. I don't know, but if you want to just unmute yourself and ask the question. Oh, um, I yeah, I think I I think I've got the question because we've had people do this. Um, so wildlife friendly, so keen, and we've put a bat box up and we put an owl box on top of it, and we're going like. No, owls eat bats. So all that owl has to do is sit uh, at the entrance to the bat box and eat all the bats. Um, yeah, uh, either or. Thank you. Uh, I think there's also a question from Lorraine. Lorraine is asking, are you finding interest in bats growing? It's difficult to tell because we've had um, you know, with the, with the expansion of Facebook and, and um, WhatsApp groups and so on, we've got a lot more interaction, but I don't know that we've got a lot more interest in bats than already were there. To a certain extent as well, we're battling to find people in the group to actually go and give talks. Um, it's, a, it's, it's quite an upheaval to actually go and give a talk to a group of people, and so, especially kids, we don't do as many school talks as we should. When we had George and Joyce in the group and they were kind of, school talk, yep, we're there, not a problem. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. And the rest of us now have to fit it in around earning our living and, and juggling the rest of our lives. And maybe so. a last question from Albert again, that if you could just comment on the interaction, I think it's an interaction between Oz and Bats. I think they have lost their... They have recently lost a juvenile bat due to rats, and they are planning to move some old boxes there. If you maybe just take a comment on the interaction between us and, and bats. Um, okay. Um, lost Losing a juvenile bat to a rat is unusual because most of bats stay out the way of rats. Um, 
I'm going to guess that was an insect-eating bat, and it was one of the roof bats, and a, and a rat got in. Yes, that can happen. Um, it's unlikely to be a fruit bat who's living on trees unless it was already on the ground. And if it's already on the ground, there was a problem with the first place. So, yeah, if you want to try and tell me whether that was an insect eating bat or if you've got a photo of it. No. So one more question from Lorraine. Lorraine is saying, is bed flu impacting bats? As far as we know, no. Um, Okay, this is, a, this is a long and complicated story, actually, because Wanda Marketer, Professor Marketer at the University of Pretoria, has always been a superb bat person and has always been brilliant about checking viruses in bats. And if we had a, if we had a dead bat, we froze it, we wrapped it in all sorts of um, layers and sealed bags and et cetera, and posted it overnight, couriered it overnight to her, and her lab would then test it for viruses. The state vet in South Africa is causing big issues with bats, and they now insist that bats have to go to their local technician to be tested for viruses first, and basically all they test for is rabies, and so we are not getting what we need. Um, interacting with the state vet and the Department of Agriculture is a challenge, and it's a big challenge all around. We had, we had a system that worked brilliantly. We no longer do, so yeah. So All as right, far as we know, bird flu, as far as we know, no, we haven't had bats with bird flu, but how would we know? Because the state vet won't test for it. All right, Kate, thank you very much for your time and also for walking us through the 30 years of the work that you have done. In the chat section, people have agreed that it has been a brilliant and also insightful talk from Bats Without Borders. I was the host for today. My name is Christopher Imakando, the Capacity Development Officer for Bats Without Borders. We hope to see you again next next month or in April on the fourth Wednesday of April. Again, when we are going to have another exciting winged webinar from us. Thank you very much to everyone who was able to join us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, everybody.